Okay, everybody, today we've got a discussion between Mike and Hugh. Uh, Mike's over on the West Coast, um, and yeah, I'm in Greece on a boat. Um, so Mike, what, what's the lockdown situation like now? So it's been almost since March since we had uh, a lockdown, and at this time they're easing up on the lockdown. So they're starting to open up all the, uh, I think they started off with the barber shops. Um, they're starting to open up the gyms. Uh, um, I think movie theaters are, are coming. So they're slowly trying to ease the lockdown, but the cases, especially in my area, is still been um, still high. So it's still a uh, bigger, so, as of yesterday, I checked, it was about 2,000 new cases in the uh, LA, LA County area. And then that, that hasn't gone down. So I, I checked a month before it was 1,000. So it's still been on a steady, still pretty high every day. So people want the economy to continue, but um, the cases are still up there. So it's, it's a balancing act at this point for, um, for LA and the people here yeah I get the strong impression that they're throwing us all under the bus for the sake of the economy while the corporations get bailed out they're not bailing out the people I think 80% of people are you know one paycheck away from from the street and right they it's I think it's get, it's hard to get unemployment now um, in Washington it's getting harder and so they're not doling out free cash for the workers, but for corporations, yeah, they, they're making sure that uh, they can squeak by. Um, yeah, so, but people are wearing it, right? Are they, or, or do they see it that way? Do they, are yeah. they still with the program or not? Yeah, now, um, I, I think a majority of the people believe that it's, it's a real uh, thing. It's a real uh, virus It can harm you. It's not um, how I know Trump in the beginning phases says, said that it's a Chinese flu. It's, it's fake, fake news. It's trying to, um, it's just the Democrats trying to um, put them down. But no, I think now everyone's at the point where, um, you know, it's a real virus, but at the same time uh, we want, or, people want the economy to continue because they need to uh, live. They need the paycheck to buy their groceries, to pay the rent. So um, a lot of people here are at that uh, predicament. And, um, but more than that, um, you know, since the COVID started, a lot of people here lost their jobs. Um, last time I checked, I think it was, it was just a month ago, I think over 50% of uh, residents in LA County don't have a job and that may have gone up now because it hasn't really gotten better and a lot of shops had to change the way they run their things like uh, their business so um, like restaurants have to, have to be at 50% capacity they can't have um, too many people and other businesses had to follow suit um, and lately I've been speaking to friends um, different, uh, of different job sets, um, government. Um, the ones who seem to be hit the most are the ones who are, I would say, the, uh, the ones who have like um, personal, like uh, uh, one, one friend of mine is a, uh, like a trainer. So he does personal training and it hit him really hard because he doesn't get um, that much business anymore. Uh, either people are afraid to do like close contact business that re requires you to touch someone. And he himself is also trying to be cautious. So for many of um, those individuals, um, oh, and not to mention, uh, since I'm in LA, there's a lot of people who do acting, singing, um, those type, those industries are, are at, at a halt right now, right? Um, they're not they're not able to do their gigs, um, the auditions. That's there's there's nothing that, as far as I know about how they're going to continue those type of businesses. 
So a lot of these people are going to try to find regular jobs. But the thing is, the regular jobs aren't there now. So it's like they're, they're caught in a bind. So everyone's trying to scrap, like those without a job or whose business industries have been hit are, looks like they're trying to scramble to, to get something. And uh, their only thing right now is unemployment, right? That's why that unemployment um, shot up, especially in the US. Um, there's been many um, graphs that show the US is just way up there on unemployment compared to other countries. And, and that's why I think U.S. definitely were known, or if, if, if I'm not mistaken, it's U.S. is pretty much a gig economy. A lot of our industrial jobs went overseas uh, manufacturing. So what are the what are the jobs left? Starbucks, um, yeah, uh, just service jobs essentially. Yeah, so it was especially in the U.S. Service industries all this time, but um. Yeah, what are the lessons people are taking from this? Are they, I mean, the bigger lessons. Do people just seeing this as just an isolated comment that came in and hit us? Or are they seeing it in terms of, you know, systemic issues and their warnings about how the system is run, that things should change? What do they just think, yeah, these things happen, and we just have to get through it? What's, what's the bigger lesson that they're learning from all of this? My hope and I'm, I think, I hope I'm starting to see it correctly that the longer COVID uh, coronavirus runs its course, the longer it doesn't, I guess, give up its grasp, the more people will see the systemic uh, issues, which they, they started, it started with the uh, protests, right? With the um, killing of George Floyd. That may have been um, a spark in a lot of people's brains, just on the, uh, the topic regarding um, police brutality, because police brutality has been in the, in the U.S. for so long, but it's just that we had so much distractions going on, and we said, okay, the state will handle it. The police can police themselves. Great. Um, I, I got to do this job, or I gotta, I've got things to do right now, but now that things slowed down, um, we we're able to see, hey, you know what? This isn't just this is a serious thing. It's been happening so much. And I think the black community has known this all like since for a long time. It's just right now, everyone starting to catch on everyone else who, who wasn't aware. Um, even the Karens, the <laughs> everyone who, who turned uh, a different direction is now faced with, okay, police brutality is, is a real thing in America. It's the police has too much, they have too much power and they're not doing their job. And that's what uh, it, it, people stopped and thought, right? That's one of the things that happened with the virus. I, I thought that I noticed that people paused in their life. And, and that's the reason why I, I, revel, I revived the alternate reality game. Because when I started it, I could get no interest because people are just so busy doing nothing. Yeah. They're just doing crap at a, fur at a furious rate. Um, if you actually look at what people are doing, it's just pure crap, 24 hours a day of pure crap. But they think it's very important and they run around chasing their tails and they're busy, busy. It's almost like, uh, you know, people get their cultural self-worth from being busy. If, if I'm busier than you, I'm more important than you. <laughs> if right. you know, my, my time, you want a slice of my time, then basically uh, that's more valuable than your time. So I'm the boss, you know, and it's, it seems like this culture suddenly came to a screeching halt where everybody had, had nothing to do and they had to start mm -hmm. looking at stuff and looking at their lives and do a bit of introspection. And then suddenly I noticed that people were suddenly interested in social change and you know, so that, that pause was a moment of reflection that was desperately needed. But I'm not yeah. sure that I've seen many people come to the conclusions I would take from this. I mean, there's some obvious conclusions yeah. just from biology that if, if you've got a pandemic, it doesn't come from nowhere. It doesn't just fall out of the sky. What it is, is it's telling you that basically you, you, the, 
economy is too close coupled. The global industrial system is too close coupled. It means that people are too mobile, too many people flying around on jets. And it's, you know, traditionally since time immemorial, it's saying that basically the population is too dense. That basically, we, there's too much crowding on the planet. So there's too much crowding and too much movement. And that's what a pandemic is saying to you. But I don't think anybody, I don't, I don't think anybody got that. They, they still just can't wait to get planes going again and stuff. And you say that that's what the virus is telling you. We can't have planes. We can't have things. Right. Like that. Right. Do you yeah. see anybody getting any sort of the messages, what I would call the right messages? I think it's, to be completely honest, it's going to take more time because well, before the COVID happened, um, I guess, I'll just define it as like human consciousness where we were still at a surface level, right? In terms of what's going on around the world, the state of the economy. Um, it seems like governments have been doing a good job of, of separating the, the bad and the good, only letting, I guess, their citizens just see what they want to see, right? Through um, media, social media, um, on TV, you, you only see kind of like this uh, picturesque. It's not it's not reality, and and so we're we're so conditioned to see a certain point of view that uh, to get from that, which is business as usual, what we've always been doing before COVID, to okay, we are so not in the right like global uh, extinctions, all of this is in our future, but to get from here to there, it's, it's really tough. I mean, speaking, just speaking to friends, um, living normally in my life, um, I always like to see, okay, who's kind of catching it? Is this, is COVID kind of um, helping them see um, what's about to happen? And for a majority of people, um, I think you hit it on, you got it on the, uh, you got it right. Um, it's for some, it's still just a, a one-off thing. They said, um, even a lot of people I talk to, they say everything will come back to normal, but for now we just have to handle the situation as it is. Um, don't worry. And I said, well, uh, I might, I mean, in my mind, I'm always thinking it's, <laughs> This is only the beginning, but if that's what you believe, okay. Like I can't, I can't convince you right now. Uh, <laughs> and yeah. and that's the funny thing is, um, we can show all the evidence. Um, I mean, before uh, you know what's funny, I I was able through COVID, I was able to find your videos. I, I don't know, I just stumbled upon it because I guess in my mind I was trying to look for. Um, some way to, to deal with the situation. Um, I followed Guy McPherson's work extensively, um, followed his page uh, almost every day and um, tried to look at other um, climate collapse channels, uh, collapse channels. But I felt like there was something more we can do besides just kind of give up or continue living our lives the way we like where we are but I guess after looking at your videos I saw okay there's a little bit more we can do to um, I guess before extinction we, we can't just I guess give up <laughs> oh yeah no there's there's yeah. a whole lot to do on a, on a personal level and also on a world level um, you know that if I mean, I think that the, the only thing we can do is kind of a Hail Mary pass for where we're at as a species is, is to de-industrialize. But nobody's going to do it. It's basically to, uh, I think most people, and certainly I, think I would guess that the, the richer you are, the more this is true. But I think most people would rather die than lose the industrial system, lose the economy. It's become such a god that we're welded to it, so our life depends on it in most people's minds. And uh, the, the idea that there has to be growth 
the, the whole economy works from an expectation of hope and a, and a return of profit. So why people have to have an, uh, an expectation um, of, of trust in the economy and trust that it'll grow. But the way I see it is we're reaching limits. People, people can't deny it. Even if you're an economist, you're saying that uh, technology is not the fix all because uh, if you if you look at most technologies they're good for switching limits if you reach one limit they help you transition to another limit but they don't get rid of limits that's not what any technology does you've only got a finite set of elements on the planet to work with and you can uh, you can you can shift the pieces around on the chessboard but you don't technology doesn't say oh i'm going to upgrade my queen to basically some you know um, su uh, supernatural, you know, right. piece on the playing board. So it's not magic. But economists and lay people, people outside technology, uh, futurologists, they tend to think of it as a, a magic wand fix, like a Harry Potter fix. And I don't think it is. So I think the truth is we're at the limits. If we're at the limits, there's there's no return on the economy. If if you could get a bond, say that was a collapsed bond and sell it. <laughs> uh, that would be a fabulous thing to do, but you can't have a bond like that because, you know, it's saying that after collapse, there's, there's nothing. So we can't return your investment and everybody has a forward looking investment. So nobody will invest in deindustrialization because you can't sell it. You say, what's the upsell? Well, you get to live. Yeah, but what does that mean in economic terms? I get to live as a virtual hunter gatherer if I'm lucky. And then people say, well, that's a crap return. I would rather go all out with, you know, fossil fuel bonds, <laughs> which <laughs> might return for the next 10 years, maybe 20, and then we have collapse. But at least I'm avoiding the hunter gatherer outcome where I'd be dirt poor. At least I'm, wouldn't you rather be rich for 20 years and go out with a bang than then you know, with certainty, subsist as say a Kung person or Piraha person and in the, in the, basically then you do it poor by our standards. And then that would be certain, but it would start immediately. There's no sell that you can do for that no. in the economy or the way we've got to be thinking. Right. So I think that that, that um, so it makes it a kind of inevitability that the, the collapse must come because there's no way out. It's a trap. Uh, once, once you've once you've bitten this uh, poison fruit, you can't really go back. And then, to capital, to grow this economy, to grow the global industrial system, there's been a fantastic demand for labour, and we've always fulfilled it by basically population expanding the populations. Mm -hmm. So demographics mean that now we have to stick with this program. Otherwise, seven billion odd people can't be fed. And so we're completely stuck. We're looking right yeah. down the barrel with, with COVID. And no one can even stop flying because it's saying, you know, that then you're getting closer to the day when, you know, you, ha you, you have this food system that doesn't feed 7.8 billion people anymore. It, it needs a lot of transport, a lot of infrastructure. And that needs fossil fuel. Uh, just pie in the sky to think that you can't do it with fossil fuel. So the day comes closer, but nobody will yeah. say anything. Nobody, nobody will really talk about it. Uh, look it in the eye. Even collapsed people won't really look it in the eye, and even uh, overpopulation. But it, it doesn't mean that you have to give up and roll over. I mean, it's, it's kind of like uh, if you're on the Titanic, uh, you know, it's kind of like being aware on the Titanic, a fully aware disaster. <laughs> it, yeah. My book is better than a, a blind hysterical disaster is what we're going to head for. And the other thing I'm really scared of is from my experience in South Africa, and that's that you get to a point with a managed extinction. If they manage the extinction or collapse all the way down, micromanage. Yeah. It's, it's really gets scary then. You can see, because there are lots of examples. Yeah. If you look at like the, the fall of Germany in 1945, mm -hmm. everybody who had any sense, well, it, it really looks very much like, like us today because anybody that had any sense knew after Stalingrad that Germany in the Third Reich was finished. But they took another two years, you know, basically 
just fulfilling this dreadful, inevitable thing, putting one foot forward in front of the other till the collapse. And they did exactly the same thing as we are doing now. They were they put all their hope in these V weapons and technology. Yeah. Technology will step in in the final hour. Of course, it didn't. But uh, we're doing exactly the same thing now on a global scale. And if you look at Nazi Germany and Berlin at the fall, it's just a gruesome, gruesome story. It's been largely covered up because, because you know, we're the allies and we won, mm -hmm. and then we whitewash it, and it was a good right. war against Hitler. And you, we whitewash a lot of things. We whitewash what happened um, to Germany, mm -hmm. um, just in terms of like the Russians were just a rape, rape machine, a rape yeah. police machine. We we completely expunge that from our consciousness. Um, and and the Allies too were also a rape machine and bad. They, we were right. really terrible. But we expunge all of that, and uh, so we don't see how bad it was for for people in Germany in that collapse. So, um, but I think if you think of it in those terms, then you think, well, there's a lot to do. One of them is fight, fight that outcome. If, if, you, if we're in the Stalingrad stage, you say like, okay, we know what happens next. Well, there's a hell of a lot to do. Then the job starts to, to fight for, you know, to avoid the bad scenarios. And so that's also part of my stick. But what do you think about all of that? Yeah, I, I completely agree. Um, I've been looking at ways to kind of see, okay, how can we get a mass movement? Because if, if we have individuals that can do this, that's good. But if, if there's like a mass, um, people just are able to, to be on the same page, then it can kind of overwhelm, um, I guess, the government or it can o overwhelm the state. Um, kind of uh, a little of what's happened, what happened at the protests. Uh, there was a protest for uh, Black Lives Matter, right, for George Floyd. Same time that was happening, there was uh, rioters and looters. And in the beginning, the, the police force was overwhelmed and they were caught off guard until they brought on the, um, the, the, the National Guard, yeah. they installed a curfew. So you kind of see if some if the people are able to do something, then the state will react um, with force. And so that first, that's something that's kind of like a, a research for us. That's like, okay, if we do this, they're gonna react somehow. And but at the same time, it also it's also another teaching situation um, or teaching moment where we have if we can, if there's some collective action, it can also scare the state because they wouldn't do those actions, right? Bringing the National Guard, instill a curfew, close some businesses, board the businesses, unless it was serious. Um, one thing I'm also curious to see the outcome is Chaz, um, the auto autonomous zone in, in Seattle. Um, I haven't looked at it, but there's, uh, as far as I know, they're still there. They're still holding down that area. I'm, I'm, the, the I'm watching it develop. Yeah, I'm watching that develop. Um, that's an interesting thing because basically it's an anarchic community, and they've done it. What they're doing is uh, exarchia in uh, in Athens, um, an anarchic community there. I don't. In my videos, right from the first go, I made the first video I made said, you know, you can't get rich to escape the system. Um, and the second one, you can't drop out. And what I said is these countercultural communities, they're never going to work. Uh, and um, XOK is, is an example because they've, they've, they've swept it out now. The latest government that won in July last year they promised to clear it out and they have. Oh, right. um, and so the, the reason is it's a threat. It's a threat to the, it's not neutral. So Trump said now in Tulsa, he said that he's been advised to leave Chaz alone to prove oh. to America that, you know, all these left-wing um, idealistic programs won't work. Now, that's a very dangerous statement because they do work. That's, that's the problem with them. So for example, like in, in um, 
Catalonia in 1936, they worked so well that the the factories were were clean and they were oh, yeah. they doubled the production in the factories. Everything worked beautifully, so much so that Franco's forces had to erase it. They they got fantastic factories that were worth millions and they raised them to the ground because they couldn't have them as examples of how anarchy works. And the same applies to, to somewhere like Chaz. If it starts to work, if they show that there's no crime and uh, people can cooperate, they don't need uh, banks, they have alternative uh, sources of funding, they have um, mutual aid and uh, community support, that's a very, because America doesn't mm -hmm. have that. So, if, uh, so that's a direct challenge to the ideology. Yeah. Of, and so they, there are too many options for the state to undermine it. They can send in people with drugs. They can send in gangs. They can basically do um, yeah. surgeons, fifth columnists. And, uh, you know, so, so uh, the community could work if left alone. But if the state wants to undermine it, they have a lot of power to do that. And then it's very hard to grow an anarchic state under opposition while you have direct opposition from the government. And so that's why I think it, it won't work because it's kind of doing either way. Either, either yeah. you can't get it together, in which case the government says, there, we told you this, the, yeah. uh, you've got to stick with capitalism. Or otherwise it does work and then they undermine you deliberately. And just to say, oh, it was a drug infested, crime ridden, saw on Seattle and we've got rid of it. So now you've got to stick with capitalism. But then they will defeat it either way. Um, I think a lot of liberals don't realize that. I think a lot of people in Exxon don't realize that, that uh, they think they have a lot of autonomy because liberals do. Liberals have, you know, basically democratic freedoms. And so then they think, oh, I have the democratic freedom to do everything, like even break away from the system. No, you have democratic freedoms within the system. If you try to break away, that's insurrection. They will come down hard on you. And liberals don't understand that. They think that the, the system will allow you to go and get a vegetable patch in a little community somewhere. But it's never been true. If you go back to the diggers and um, the ranters and those, those guys, all they did was go and, you know, buy plots of land and turn them into basically Chaz communities. And uh, it was such a threat to the local system. I mean, this is in the 17th century that they came and, you know, rounded them up, beat them up, killed them uh, just because the communities were working. Peasants were leaving the land of, of you know, under peonage and going to these communities because they were fun. People worked about 15 hours a week <laughs> at their time doing exactly what they're doing in chess, yeah. like uh -huh. teaching each other to read and write and doing poetry uh -huh. and song and theater and dancing around and drinking. And, and that's what free people do. So it was yeah. very attractive. And <laughs> landlords um, just went apeshit <laughs> because they knew yeah. that if that, that became a thing and spread, um, it could. So the only thing to say, one last thing, and then I'll hand over to you, but the, the only thing to say about those autonomous communities is uh, if enough of them start out, uh, if, they, yeah. if they grow like mushrooms, um, and that can happen with, with a collapse in the economy. So basically, if a lot of people are unemployed, now 40 million in the States, uh, what happens is they band together in hobo communities and then those hobo communities are not like most people think Mad Max. They, they, they actually have a lot of solidarity and mutual aid and support. And what, if you go back and read the history um, of the Great Depression, one of the things they hid from all the liberals <laughs> with the Green New Deal now, the Roosevelt's New Deal, one of the aims of it which has been lost now in all the history books was that the government felt under threat from communism because more and more people were going to these hobo communities and alternative lifestyles were starting so they didn't only go and do you know the vpa projects and stuff to give people money and put money in their pockets they did it to save capitalism because people were starting mm -hmm. to drift away from capitalism and that narrative has been lost so it's possible that but, you know, that, that it goes viral 
and you get a lot of people trying a Chaz kind of thing. They just say, boot the, the police out. Kind of, it's happened in Mexico. So more and more places are just saying, look, we don't need the police. The police are as corrupt as the crooks, which is where America's got to. It, it kind of feeds down from the top. You have crooks at the top, basically the, the crime mentality, the entitled crime mentality filters down until basically the dogs have it. And the cops are just basically the security detail for the rich criminals. So that's what people are seeing now. They f they're finally feeling that, you know, basically the, the guard dogs of the rich are corrupt. And in Mexico, they said, look, we don't need you. And, um, oops, that's my ankle alarm. <laughs> Uh-oh. Sorry, I got I got a lot. Of, there's a lot of wind, and uh, oh, just my anchor's dragging a li little bit, but it's not fat enough, so I have to do something yet. But, okay. So yeah, so um, yeah, so that's that's the thing. And in Mexico, they said, "Look, we've had enough. You you're not you're not protecting us. Uh, we can do a better job ourselves." Kicked the police out, and and made a a police free zone. Um, so if if that happens more and more, um. Yeah, that could turn into something, but it's, I can't imagine it's really taking over the whole country as an ethos, you know, but who knows, who knows, you know, yeah, anyway, yeah, I think, I've been talking. Oh, on. no worries, uh, it has this, we, yeah, we need to essentially start somewhere, so I think um, Chaz seems like a good start, um, and yeah, the hope is for it, for it to, for people to realize, okay, this is something we can we can do eventually if well if we all come to the conclusion that collapse is inevitable. We need there there has to be some sort there has to be something that comes after it, right? Which is is it going to be a managed collapse? Which is the state's just going to micromanage, take control of every aspect of our lives from the time we eat to the time we poop to um, I mean, yeah, so they're going to control every second of our life versus the alternative, which uh, you defined as a manumission extinction. We, uh, as just normal people collectively, try to uh, live through this collapse. Um, and I know you mentioned a scenario in your, in your book, right, the uh, St. George uh, and the methane dragon, um, a possible scenario where people just help each other through the collapse, right? Where we can uh, share resources. Um, and I guess in my mind, it's, it's a dignified way of collapse. Dig um, I mean, we all, we all die and, and I believe that, it, uh, I mean, I'd wish for a, a dignified death for all of us yeah, Not, it's um, better to die happy than to <laughs> die in some Because the scenario that's also possible is gas chamber, Nazi Germany. Yeah. The, that the is campus, <laughs> the, basically the, the autonomous community. The, there is a state version of that, and that's the labor camps come death. Oh, right. So, so it's it's the choice between um, an anarchic community or a death camp eventually, and it, right. it depends on whether the state survives. But so yeah, I said that in my book, and what I was trying to push in my book is the idea of an anarchic community. Um, but the the more important thing is to get a culture of resistance. It's like Derek Johnson right. says, and um, uh, deep green resistance is that culture of resistance is more important because mm -hmm. uh, you, you have the space to have an anarchic community if you have that culture of resistance. So, so it's like, like in Afghanistan, they, they just really a bunch of mountain herders, um, oh, yeah. uh, guerrillas. But they, they held off many empires, they held off the British Empire. They're basically, yeah. you know, Afghanistan's the graveyard of empires. Now, what makes it different to other places is they have a culture of resistance. They will have mountain mm -hmm. terrain, but, yeah. but they have a culture of resistance. They have a very, you know, right back to the Persian times when they had like, you know, we have the term in English, parting shot. What parting shot means, you know, it's just like a shot over your shoulder. 
is is really it's it was really called a partisan shot from the Carpathian Mountains, and basically what the guys were notorious for doing was to coming in the attack, but then turning around and just shooting over their shoulder while they retreat, uh, yeah. which would drive an <laughs> army nuts. <laughs> 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 They did, uh, but, but that that idea of just harassing harassing the establishment to death without confronting yeah. them is part of the culture of resistance, and it goes all the way. So oh, yeah. In prison, like for example, I'll give an example of the culture of resistance in in South Africa. Is like um, when Mandela and the people in ANC that were sent to Robben Island as political prisoners, when when they got to Robben Island. They didn't stop fighting. They they actually got to the point where they ga they gained the respect of the jailers because mm -hmm. they had this from the day one. They they fought in whatever way they could. So or even to the point where they would they would try and be obstinate. So when when they were marched around, they would march a little bit slow. So they would frustrate the guards. And then oh, they would yeah. march a little bit yeah. fast, That's and they're basically okay. telling the guards, yeah. "You, I'm in charge. You, you have to keep pace with me." Yeah. Of course, if they overstep it, then they get whacked. But it right. gives so much that the guys know that you you're resisting them, but not enough that it's worth clubbing you for. You know, they, yeah. they res resist in another way, so they're being violent. But anyway, that that culture was just use it as an example to say that culture of, of resistance. It goes all the way down to the deepest dungeon that they can throw you in. Um, and then, you know, even if they're torturing you, they can feel your resistance. They can feel that you're not broken. And what they did in the, um, in those uh, political prisons like Robben Island was eventually they won. They, they basically owned Robben Island. Effectively, they managed and owned Robben Island because the, the, the guards realized that they don't have as much conviction as the prisoners. And uh -huh. so they were kind of won over to just realize, you know, these guys are better than us. They more, you know, they have more stamina than we can muster. So it's kind of like uh, resistance can, can muster more stamina than outright hate or fear. Uh -huh. So these guys, the guards were, you know, in South Africa, the dynamic of the, of the jailers was fear, right? They, it was really the white people were were scared for their lives. That's why they they were scared of genocide. So that's why they were pumping down. And it's the same with Trump and these guys that the left wing kind of thinks, oh, you know, these are white supremacists and they're thinking about white power and so it's, it's no that they thinking about white genocide. They're thinking in terms of terror. They still and that's why they react. And the police now are scared shitless. That's why they react. Oh, right. They don't put on yeah. armor because they're strong. They put on armor because they're weak and scared. So people don't understand that dynamic. So if, mm. you, if the people show that they have more determination, then the uh, you know all the guys working from their reptilian brain they fold their cards. Wow. Against you. But if if you don't, if you act like a sheep, that reptilian brain will never give in. It'll go right down to the wire. Extinction, you know, right down to like Berlin and <laughs> the rubble. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I see. So that leads me to two thoughts. Um, developing, like, especially uh, where I am, the, how to develop a uh, culture of resistance. Um, because as I see it, a lot of people are following the, I guess, instructions are the rules the laws and uh, it's the belief that if we follow the rules and the laws everything will be okay but uh, and it, it comes down from the bottom to the top um, in my mind uh, I really thought for some reason that um, because in LA there's a lot of homeless right that they may be the first to rise up because they um, they don't have uh, you know, the resources that people in the middle class and upper class have. Uh, what I realize is even though they don't have, they might not have access to those resources like a home, the state, um, especially in, in our area, they still provide to the homeless so 
they still give them some money to buy food. So in a way, even though a person is doesn't have a home, they're still tied to the state somehow. And that's in each and every level. The yeah. homeless yeah. are tied, middle class are tied with a job. And yeah. And so, uh, I mean, in my mind, I think, okay, do, do we need to come to that conclusion that the two scenarios before we can develop a culture of resistance or, I mean, it's, because another thing that came to my mind is in regards to developing a culture of resistance is how much do we resist? Um, I think a lot of people, especially myself at one point, thought that I had to do a full-on resistance, like um, just uh, without any regard for myself, just uh, do something create like, um, I guess um, uh, the only thing that comes to my mind is are people that that done like the extreme things, but they've been um, gone. Like Ted Kaczynski, his his strategy of bombing, of using the bombs, um, and he was, I mean, he's still in jail today. Um, Ed Snowden, who just leaked information, and he's in Russia, so. It, I thought, oh my gosh, it's people are going to be afraid of resisting because all these people who try to resist uh, or known to resist, they've been hit hard by the state. So I think there's a lot of fear factor that um, a lot of people have. States do. Yeah. I mean, that's that's what states do. That's what any any authoritarian regime since the Sumerians. They basically singled out the tall nails and hit them hard. The, the aim is not to be a tall, tall nail. The, na the aim is to get everybody to stand up slowly. <laughs> so, uh, <right. laughs> you see, if you do a spectacular, you're really playing into their hands because they'll take you down spectacularly. What they, they can't do is if, if all the ants rise slowly together. And so, so you, the ants can be pushed far enough so that they all rise. But in general, the, you can't look to the homeless people and the people that are suffering most from systemic violence and the system because they have learned helplessness and they have a lot of negative coping mechanisms like drugs and alcohol. And uh, yeah, so they're not a good source of a revolution. But traditionally, the sources of a revolution are people that have strength and moral strength and they often come from the middle to upper classes so it gets lost in the dialogue because it looks like a popular rising of the masses but very often they come from the upper echelons i mean kropotkin was a prince <laughs> so so the the system what's really dangerous to the system is defectors in the upper echelon especially guys that they don't know about if you got a billion that was turned against the system and said, look, like, like a Bill Gates or something. And you said, look, I've got all these billions. I'm not, I've given up on the idea that you can do good works in, you know, foundations. I'm going to basically spend my fortune to do deindustrialization. Now that, that kind of person could, could do it. They could do it with a snap of their fingers virtually. But they, but the thing is that, if you you must you think of it as like starting a rot start the rot in their system uh -huh. um so it's it so the idea is to start small do tiny little micro acts of resistance till people get a taste for resistance you see where the system is vulnerable is if people get their self-worth and they start you see at the moment everybody feels shit. they go and they go uh -huh. on to collapse they go on to, they read the news and the news uh, makes yeah. people feel shit and demoralized. It's, de it, it's uh, innovating. It basically puts you down. If you resist by doing some tiny little act like we do in our ARG, then you get this little hit of dopamine to say like, I'm resisting, I'm getting away with it. It's almost like being a pyromaniac. It starts to be a drug. No one knows it's you, it's your own power trip. But it's your own private power trip. And if you get, a, get hooked on that drug, you can spread that drug around. 
if people are large numbers of people are getting a fix from from resisting the system you have all the benefits of like you know uh basically addiction is uh, you know basically ramping up addictions and stuff you do more and more things that are against the system because you get a kick out of it you get the same benefit <laughs> and so yeah i think if you show people the way that they can feel alive by resisting that's very dangerous and it in in and it can be symbolic to start off with eventually you only need by my way of thinking and i think ted kaczynski and all these guys you only need about 500 lone wolves they can bring the entire industrial system down they guys that are on the right levers and we don't know who they are uh, yeah. if you start a culture of resistance you can tell that basically you can see it happen you know when when you can see it happen more on the right wing than the left we need to get this working more on the left but on the right wing they have all these conspiracy theories and it is a culture it's the wrong culture but it is a, a proto culture of resistance as soon as something happens like covid you see this guy gets in a train and goes and tra- yeah. <laughs> and puts it in the side of a ship i mean completely stupid but for him there's you know there's some other guy who is in a position of uh, at a bottleneck in one of the systems that could do real damage we don't know what all those bottlenecks are and sensitive points of of dependency but all complex system have, have master switches and fatal right. flaws just a right. and you know handful of sand in the machine and the whole thing yeah. stops you know they all have the the, the achilles heel Right. and the guys whose job is to sit at this Achilles heel you want to eat away at those guys and then you know one or two of those guys is all it takes and you you'll never know it was your movement but you know that you just do it in the hopes that some you know the more people you can reach and see that we've got to stop this the system right. The, the more likely you are to get some guy who can actually do it who's sitting at one of the crucial switches but you don't really want to have some guy who's you know doesn't have a lot of resources out on a limb somewhere doing something uh, spectacular like getting in a train because it's just a waste of a life <laughs> i see yeah. <laughs> yeah you could have done far better undermining you, you see that the main thing to the the precursor to starting a culture of resistance is to start a culture of doubt so every everybody has their little anchors and securities they have their little coping mechanisms they have their little beliefs and then that's how they keep their world together if you if you know a way at those and leave people without any anchors then they might start to to resist but they need a kind of a breakdown to get there you need to oh, yeah. you know, they, they people believe in science they believe in what the teachers told them they believe right. in the economy they believe that in the government even even radicals against the government believe deep down i mean even like exar like roger hallam mm-hmm. you know is a guy who wants to overthrow the government but deep down he actually believes in it he, he's actually uh-huh. lobbying the government for change it's like uh-huh. are you crazy <laughs> <Wow>. <laughs> the government's you know call marx the, the the government's uh, just the security detail of the corporations you know they're basically completely in their pocket so so but you see those are, so so like a guy like Roger Hallam you you want to undermine uh, the, the 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 belief that the government can do it's a green technologies are very bad for this they give they give people false hope and they think you know well we if we stick with the system it'll generate enough money to do green initiatives we'll have renewables so it's a complete pipe dream but right. but uh we, we need more movies and stuff like you know planet of the humans because then people oh, start yeah. to think shit you mean my favorite Ouija doll is not going to help and you say yeah, yeah when all your hexes and totems and rabbit's foots are all done they start thinking well we're fucked and say not really yeah. now you can start doing something yeah start asking right. some questions but you need to first undermine the belief system yeah. the cultural belief system and start a new culture it's the hardest thing you can do cultural change is the hardest thing you can do but we have you know the news on our side does every bad headline from the arctic is saying oh yeah this can't go on you know so right. so you know 
we're getting closer to yeah. the point where people say, you know, okay, we, we have to resist. You know? Right. And um, just an aside with the planet of the eight, I'm sorry, planet of the humans. Um, there was a, a point, a, a comment that I saw that that movie didn't even, um, I don't think it talked about um, that. Yes, it's true that um, the green technology uses up um, the fossil fuel, which makes it unsustainable. But even if all the green technology, somehow we are able to master it, perfect it to the point that it's, it's usable, we're still left with the, what's it, Jer Jevons paradox, where just because uh, more of that resource. So either way, um, it, it's, it's bad news for, for using green technology, any way you look at it, whether it's using up more, it's, Event, it's going to use up all the res uh, the fossil fuels, so that's just yeah, that's just a bad deal. Yeah, um, what, what I think what the planet of the humans is is the the important thing about it is is it's it's saying that we've got diverted, we got diverted, all right. and yeah. so into thinking that it's all about energy, finding alternative sources of energy, and it's so saying no, it's not. It's, um, that's got almost nothing to do with it. Even if you did, like you say, with the Germans paradox, but you know, the United Nations says that by 2050, we'll have to double um, My gosh. the amount of energy we consume. Right. And, and so it's like, it's, it's, where's that gonna come from? It's not coming yeah. from solar panels. Solar panels, sure, we'll have solar panels, but yeah. that's just gonna be an addendum to this, fossil machine, you know, we're gonna, that, none of that oil is gonna stay on the ground. Why would it? Somebody will burn it. Some guy in Africa will burn it if you won't. So, so it's a distraction to get, uh, you know, off on this, this idea. And, and what it does is it perpetuates the underlying belief in the system. And that's what we need to, uh, to undermine, saying that, you know, we can't believe in the system anymore. But it, it's a monumental problem because we don't really have a lot of access to people in China and India. And, to, oh, and our yeah. faith really, really hinges on China. And we have almost mm -hmm. zero influence. You right. know, they have a complete lockdown on the mindset of people in China and it's complete surveillance states and totalitarian. And, and really how, how people think in China is really determines our faith. So if, if they do the Belt and Road Initiative, we screwed. Oh. Yeah. And uh, so, so it's, it's, it's a hard, hard problem, but you can only do what you can. So you basically, as right. an individual, you just, in my view, you just take the right stance. And the best. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the thing is, we can take the right start. Uh, we also need um, people to, and you alluded to it, um, there needs to be some kind of a breakdown. Um, in my mind, the only way we, people can get this certain breakdown is through some kind of traumatic event. And I don't know how we can have some, um, a, like we can have a mass amount of people getting a, a traumatic event in their lives to start questioning their system, to start doubting. Because uh, at this point in time, so, so many people are glued to their phones, um, glued to social media. Um, that it, it's it's difficult, and uh, sometimes I wonder. Okay, what's uh, what do we do? Do we get people? Um, how do we get people off their phones? Um, so those are those are things that that come to my mind. Yeah. Oh, we get a few ideas for that. <laughs> oh, yeah. All oh, right. The, on the production meeting uh, later. Oh yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. So, yeah, but like, but even. Even more, yeah, getting people off their phones is, is, is important because it's basically, it's, we're under digital pacification. These, these phones are really, you know, ankle bracelets for a prison planet. And, but I think even more important, even than maybe getting people off their phone is, is particularly Gen Z is getting them, their belief away from, from uh, the internet. So basically, they, they believe in the internet. They believe that it's a force for good. They believe that, you know, again, like social media 
is not inherently evil. There are good parts and bad parts. And it's, that narrative needs to be undermined. So the very, fr the very lowest hanging fruit is that it won't last. You see, the problem is Gen Z thinks it will last. I, I mean, I've had conversations with people on, on Reddit that, um, that, that people honestly believe that uh, the internet is a kind of a benchmark. And it's kind of, they think it's kind of like once you've achieved that achievement level um, as a species, uh, that's a kind of, that's locked in. You can't go back from that. So they think now we've got to, you know, uh, digital global communications, that's it. Our species has that locked in. We can only go forward from there. We don't have to fall back to the stone age. And it's like, it's ludicrous, you know, basically. It, our communication systems are more fragile than they've ever been because the grid just has to go down and we've lost all the knowledge we have. That never used to be the case when we had books, right? And so, yeah, it, I mean, if, if you try and start uh, doing an investigation on prepping or how, you know, survival skills, and you can't Google anything and the internet's down and the grid's down, you're in deep trouble. But people don't see it that way. But as soon as you explain it to them, yeah, then they suddenly worry. And then that's a good place to get to. And it's an easy thing to right. undermine people's belief that the, that the internet can stay up. In that particular conversation I was having with a guy on Reddit, I said, yeah, basically, I kind of was trolling him and saying like, yeah, we, he said, why would the grid go down? I said, because we're going to make it come down with 500 lone wolves that are doing it right now. <laughs> and he shot himself because he's like, we an ape shit because it's like, why would you want to do that? Because we yeah. need to industrialize, basically right. industrialize it. So like, and he went ape shit about, you, you're a bunch of bastards, but see, I got my wish, which is that, that he suddenly went from thinking we, we have the internet locked in yeah. so that our species can never fall back and to thinking you these bastards are gonna <laughs> basically take away my internet <laughs> within an hour. Yeah. You see how easy it is when you get right. you know, the right thing. Right. Uh, in, I don't know if you saw maybe it was about a week ago. Um the T Mobile Verizon. Um it was funny because I was just minding my own business but a lot of people like i had a friend i talked to said oh um, i wasn't able to contact anyone on my cell phone from 11 to 2 and i said oh really what what happened and <laughs> i was like wow and and just the reliance on using cell phones it's yeah but just the fact that they weren't able to use it it, it really shows the their, their the vulnerability that if they're if we can't use it um you know our anchor is gone and we can start to think differently but we need to have some little moments like that happen often i guess <laughs> yeah i mean and then there's plenty of scope for for those little moments i mean apart from like a ddos attack there's um you know the if we go to war with china america goes to war with china which is really on the cards the, the first thing that's going to happen is they're going to open up all the back doors and all these chips and planes and tanks and oh. every machine and every every washing machine in a military base and every yeah. you know centrifuge and every fridge on you know where every GI keeps his beer. They're going to be right. trying to hack those to switch them off, and they all, you know, for decades they've planted all those back doors, and they're just ready for a switch, you know. Wow. And so, wow. so you know, basically, if we went to war, that's one of the things that's on on the cards. You'd see that. I, I'm really reminded of like, you know, 9/11. Um, one of the things I noticed in 9/11, which a lot of people it passed them by. Almost nothing worked. None of the systems oh. worked. Basically, everything fell apart. One of the systems that worked absolutely perfectly, though nobody noticed, was that the ATMs shut off within about 20 uh -huh. minutes. Blanket wide. Now, I've yeah. worked on those ADMs and those systems, <laughs> and I didn't, I didn't know <laughs> they had, had it so jacked up that they could do it. I, having worked on ATMs for many, many yeah. years and banking systems, I would have told you they would never have got that right. I would have said basically it's no. But remarkably, one of the few things that worked was to close the banks and shut down the ATMs. 
So mm -hmm. there are a lot of scenarios where things could get out of control, like Trump uh, declares martial law. One mm -hmm. of the things in the wake of martial law is they shut down the, the ATMs. And, the, right. and if, you think people are, if, the, if you think people are, you know, one paycheck away from the street, well, yeah. how many people in the States actually have any kind of money in their purse other than like a credit card or... Oh, ATM? yes, yeah. So it's, it's like, you know, you're one weekend without food <laughs> because right. your ATM card doesn't work and you'll be thinking very diff differently about this system. And it, it could happen for, for a number of reasons, you know, war breaking out, just martial law, anything like mm -hmm. that. So it's good to, to spread this fear, uncertainty and doubt. Uh -huh. uh, then people will start to, if they, if they feel that, this is not a reliable system, they're more likely to defect from it. But while they believe in it, they're not likely to defect. So that's, yeah. that's one of the things, one of our aims. Right. No, I, I, <laughs> yeah, I, I agree with that. Um, it's, it's very hard to convince someone if they truly believe in, in the system and that the system is going to take care of them. Um, but, but this yeah, system doesn't warrant any belief in it. I mean, the, the the healthcare system, the financial system, right. just the, the system of of labor, will you, that you work, they give you healthcare, social security, mm -hmm. retirement, and a place to sleep is like that system is broken down. So the, this system doesn't deserve any trust at all. Um, and so yeah, in some ways, you think our job was easy, <laughs> except the fact. <laughs> People are so wedded to the system. Though. Yeah, it's sometimes it blows my mind, but it, it does take so much like to get out of it on your own. It takes so much time and energy that pe uh, I think uh, how I see a lot of people would rather just relax or watch Netflix, uh, do the easier thing than actually look into um, like if we were to tell them, oh, climate collapse is happening, the system isn't taking care of you, they, they would just scoff at, at what we would say and live on with their lives. But ah, yes, but you see, doing those kind of escape mechanisms, they don't really work. They're kind of right. low grade crap. And so watching Netflix, you can soon watch enough Netflix and then you have this kind of bored ennui um, they, they actually reduce your energy levels. If you can get people to start doing micro acts of resistance, it's very energizing. If, if, if doing resistance becomes yeah. your hobby, you scorn people that watch Netflix and you say, yeah, yeah. I'll tell you something that's a hell of a lot more fun than Netflix. Yeah. <laughs> you get a hell of a bigger buzz. And it's kind of right. flips the equation over. So you get positive energy. You personally feel energized by resisting. Uh, these, these people feel demotivated by finding right. big roots. That, that's interesting you say that because I've been thinking, okay, if people are, are glued to the screen, um, maybe we could have a VR remote. Or there's, there's a lot of people, creative people, who, who, who use maybe a Raspberry Pi. Or in Onyx Army, there was uh, that woman with the jacket. She just zips it up and it turns off the, the TV. And to me, that's, that, that, could be, that could be a fun project for many people. If they, you know, instead of watching the Netflix, take the time to do something cool. And, um, yeah, yeah the, the great part about it is, <laughs> like is it's all psychological. You don't even have to break the law or do something bad. You just exactly. have to think that that's right. <laughs> doesn't really matter whether it happened or not, exactly. as long as people think it happened, okay. it could happen. So it's, even if you just acted it out, it's, it's as big a laugh yeah. as uh, actually doing it and breaking the law. Right, right. Yeah, that could be an example of just giving, um, spreading doubt. Like if, if every time someone turns on the TV, it turns off, it's like, you know what, this is, this is bogus. I'd rather do something else. And to me, that, that's a win, right? If, yeah, but, if but they're just you off. Can, you see how it escalates? Um, because, because after a while, that, that doesn't do it for you. And you can upgrade to doing that, you know, with yeah. 
state systems and stuff like that. <laughs> pretty soon, pretty soon, you uh, hone your expertise <laughs> to be doing the whole thing. And it's, um, but you see, imagine if you a state trooper. Um, you you honestly believe in in the system. In fact, more than most, and you certainly believe the system has your back. But it doesn't really. All those guys are really out on a limb. They, it's like you know, all all for one and one for all thing is is not as deep in military establishments as they like to make out with the soldiers. So the soldiers have a lot of buddies, but the system has no loyalty to soldiers, and they don't really cognize that. I mean, a classic example is is Vladimir Putin. He uh, he changed his whole mindset. In fact, set him on the road to becoming a dictator. When, when he was in East Berlin, he was, he was uh, an officer in an East Berlin outstation. And he called up Moscow and said, there are people outside that are gonna like burn down the building. What do they do? And they said, I don't know, comrade, good luck and put the phone down. Oh, <laughs> You're on your own. And what, what he did was, was miraculous. He went outside and, you know, talked his way out of it. Oh. And, uh, but he never forgot that the system, when yeah. the system demanded that he sacrifice his life. And when he needed just advice from the system, they dropped yeah. it. And then he realized that's how it works. But yeah. like, yeah, if, if you can undermine, you know, if you can get all these ACABs and guys in the military and say like, this, you know, they're like, see what they do to vets. I mean, it's the same yeah. story oh. all over. Is, yeah. Look what they do to vets. Are you seriously oh putting down your life and, and hitting other workers? Because, you yeah. know, basically, what do you expect in return? These guys are booing. Right. They, they're not going to cut you any slack as soon as you're not defending them. So, right. so you, know, you can seriously undermine those guys. And uh, if you, if, you know, they were in, just in the Gilets Jaunes. They were, they were French police that took off their helmets in solidarity with the with the rioters. Mm -hmm. They really cut those videos out real fast. Right. That's something that were, is really bad for the state. And that's what happened. That's what happened in the trenches in World War One. is the guys realized, look, my real enemy is this asshole officer that's blowing a whistle and telling me to go and run at a machine gun. He's my enemy. It's not the other guys over there. They have the same problem. There's some asshole telling them right. to do the same thing. Well, they started to realize these fucking assholes in uniform commanding us are, the, are, are our mutual problem. It's not, you yeah. know, enemy in the next trench. He's, he's in the shit of state I am. And right. as soon as that attitude swept through the ranks, they had to basically pull troops and regiments out in, in whole divisions because, because that way of thinking got to go real, real soon. And I mean, if you if your life's at stake and some guy's saying, you know, it's time to go over the top, get on the ladder and say, I got a better yeah. idea. How about you taste this bullet from my gun? Oh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, oh. who's gonna know? <laughs> it's like, hey, we didn't go over the top because our officer here took a bullet. <laughs> Sad, isn't it? Right. And, and so, uh, yeah, they, they pulled out of Vietnam. What they don't tell you in the history books is they pulled out of Vietnam, not because of, demonstrations at home or the economic system or Nixon or anything. They pulled out of Vietnam because the troops started fragging the officers. Oh my God. Yeah. Wow. Like that, that they expect from the history books. But yeah. every army knows once the troops start fragging the officers, it's time to come home. It's time to go. Yeah. I didn't, I didn't learn about that. They just said, Oh, well, they, we just thought we'd leave Vietnam alone. I said, really? Yeah. <laughs> I was like, it's that simple? You could leave a country alone. Why, why didn't we leave Iraq alone? <laughs> like, what's, what's going on there? <laughs> but yeah. yeah. Well, anyway, I, I, so that's been a good chat. And so, yeah. Uh, I, uh, I, hope, uh, I hope you got something out of it. And I'm, I hope oh, no, definitely. We'll get it out of it if we put it up on YouTube. Yeah. So can see yeah. Let's continue the discussion, shall we? Definitely. Uh, oh. One thing I, I want to say, um, so it can maybe hit people in the U.S., um, you know, what you mentioned about, about uh, the peop um, like police officers, veterans not getting, uh, they're not going to get taken care of. Um, one thing I learned was uh, the 9-11 firefighters, it took them o over a decade to get, um, because a lot of them were getting um, health problems, 
you know, from all the, from doing the rescues and, and they weren't getting the health care they needed until I think a, a decade later. I mean, you can look it up, uh, John Stewart, um, you know, the Daily Show guy, he, he pushed for them to get their uh, uh, medical needs taken care of or paid for. Because a lot of these firefighters had to, had to do it themselves or, and, and a lot of them died because some couldn't even afford their, to pay for their, uh, for their health care. So, yeah. Well, yeah. All the states are bankrupt. I mean, most states in the, in the U.S. Are, are bankrupt now. They right. can't raise money in bonds. And so, effectively, all the firefighters and policemen and stuff that, you know, people are saying defund, they're going to be defunded anyway. They can't afford them. And yeah. you've spent your pension money. If you're right. an ACAB doing your duty and saluting the stars and stripes, look behind you. They've spent your freaking retirement money yeah. while you're being a dickhead shooting, you know, pepper, uh, pepper spraying people on the streets. You are pepper spraying your comrades while behind you, the dickheads who you're defending have basically squandered your pension money, you morons. So, yeah, I know a lot of people that came back from Iraq um, and they yeah. all the depleted uranium and the chemical weapons. Oh. The chemical weapons, the uh, the NBC alarms, they went off, um, and they screwed. Their health is screwed. Their kids' health is screwed. They had had kids afterwards, and the VA won't recognize it. The the, the oh, military insists yeah. that they weren't contaminated, and so like they were told, we don't we don't have any NBC suits. You just got to stay in place and breathe the air. Wow. And then later they said you weren't contaminated, even though they, they, they eventually told them to switch off all the alarms because they were going off like crazy and all the guys mm -hmm. were fucked. So right. they won't pay because it costs money. So I say like, yeah. you defend those guys if you want, but at some stage you've got to, even the stupidest cop on the street has to wise, wisen up and say, guys, you've got those guns pointed in the wrong direction. You know which way to point. It's just a matter of time. Right. Yep. And with that, uh, until uh, an another day, yeah, we, uh, I enjoyed this chat with you. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, well, it was been nice yeah. to meet you. It was um, nice to meet. Oh, yeah. Hope to do some more. All right. Well, thanks, Mike. It's been good. All right. Cheers then.